Hi everybody, this is Mark Lesney. Um, I'm happy to be presenting this uh, brief presentation on introduction to endovascular devices for PAD, which will be a whirlwind tour of many devices we have at our disposal. Here are my disclosures. So what I'd like to do is introduce selected, uh, many, but selected, available devices for the treatment of peripheral artery disease. Um, including antiproliferative technology, which I'll discuss briefly. Um, I won't get into this in any kind of deep dive. Obviously, the FDA is um, still weighing in on this, but um, but introduction to all these devices available. So when I think about devices uh, available to us in terms of endovascular treatment of PAD, I think about devices that help us cross, devices that help us visualize, and devices that help us treat. And those are the categories I'll be discussing. So the most fundamental crossing devices are crossing catheters and wires. There are many different types of crossing catheters. I will tell you these tend to be um, very different than just a Cumpy catheter or Bernstein catheter. Um, these are designed to have a rigid body and very good pushability through tight occlusions or uh, tight stenoses or occlusions um, where a Cumpy catheter may not pass these will. These come in various different sizes and types. You can place these coaxial so that an 035 um, can carry an 018 or an 014, um, and these have very good support systems. I'm not going to go through all of them, but there's many out there. In terms of wires, obviously there's many different types of wires, hydrophilic, non-hydrophilic, curved, non-curved. Um, I will tell you just from my perspective, um, in general for iliac disease, I tend to stay on an 035 platform. On SFA, I will usually stay 018 or 035, and then anything below the knee, 018, um, occasionally 014, and then below ankle and pedal loop, stick with an 014. Um, I'm very heavy with a GT Glide Advantage, or excuse me, a Glide Wire Advantage wire, um, as well as command wires. Those are sort of my two go-to wires. For tight uh, occlusions, um, or for occlusions, I will use um, Astato weighted wires, and these are uh, heavy weighted wires the tip that come in 20 gram 30 gram um, and they can sometimes bore through occlusions i actually use them for for venous occlusions as well um, they're quite effective again many different types of wires um, here are the weighted wires shown here um, treasure 12 which is a 12 gram wire all the way to an estado 30 which is that 30 gram wire so those are uh, crossing devices um, sometimes you need other devices to cross um, and Occasionally you can cross but cannot re-enter, so you stay subminimal. In order to get back into the lumen, your options are certainly uh, retrograde access, which uh, is a very common and uh, effective um, uh, technique, or you can use a re-entry catheter. There are multiple different types of re-entry catheters. Um, here's one of them called the Outback, and basically the way this works is it has a, um, a needle attached to a catheter, and you line it up, if you're in the subminimal space, you line it up to where the true lumen is, and you deploy the needle, and the idea is that you're fenestrating or perforating the um, subminimal plane and getting into the true lumen, so you can go from true lumen, subminimal, back to true lumen. Uh, here's sort of a, picture, a, um, a graphic of it that shows your subminimal plane. Here, you throw a needle into the true lumen, and then you can continue on. Um, one nice technique of doing this when you have retrograde access, um, if you can't uh, fenestrate from anterior, antegrade and retrograde, is to use a balloon retrograde as a target. And uh, this is an example or a uh, balloon is advanced retrograde. You target it with your outback. Um, and the idea here is you remove the wire, throw the needle, and you have instant confirmation that you actually did enter the same plane because the balloon will burst. And then you coil the wire inside the balloon. And then once you do that, you can pull the balloon back retrograde and that'll give you through and through um, flossed access. There are other re-entry catheters. A Pioneer Plus is a very powerful one. And what's nice about the Pioneer is it uses IVIS um, guidance, intravascular ultrasound. So you don't only have to, you can uh, not only visualize the true lumen on angiogram, uh, but you can also visualize it through intravascular ultrasound. You can put in uh, color flow and see the, uh, the true lumen in that way. Again, here's the example of the Pioneer. You can see your uh, catheter is subminimal, uh, which is why you need it. 
And here's the true lumen. You can see a chroma flow feature, which is a blood flow actually in the true lumen. And then you throw the needle, you direct it right at the true lumen, and you know exactly where you're throwing it. Additionally, you can actually um, change the length of the throw. So in other words, if your um, lumen is farther away, you can make it a little farther away. If it's closer, you can make it uh, closer. And this is a, a nice technique for reentry. Um, the off-road reentry device is a, a similar one. Again, your subinterval, the idea is that it has this sort of um, funnel-shaped uh, end that you can direct toward the true lumen. Uh, and similar to Outback, you have to visualize it by uh, angiography. Another one, the anterior catheter, um, this relies on a, um, a balloon that sort of orients uh, itself within uh, the vessel toward the true lumen, and then again relies on a, a needle throw, which is shown right here. The crosser catheter is not a reentry catheter, um, but actually what it is is it utilizes high-frequency mechanical vibration, and the idea is that it um, helps your catheter stay true lumen. Um, so instead of sort of dissecting into the subinimal plane, it uh, helps it stay true lumen. Um, clearly, there are some people who use this a lot. There are some people who use this not at all. Um, mixed results with, um, with users who don't favor it, obviously. Um, but it's going to be a powerful tool if you need to stay true lumen and uh, if you get comfortable using this device. The Wingman catheter is a, a microcatheter. And the idea is that it's sort of um, dotters or pokes. Uh, the uh, CTO, the chronic total occlusion, so that you again stay true lumen. Um, it's a way of avoiding subinimal. And the idea is that it engages and fractures the cap of the um, CTO to stay true lumen. Here's an example. You have a wire that uh, can't be advanced through a CTO. You advance the wingman and you sort of spin it, uh, try to um, rotate through the occlusion. Uh, follow it with a wire, dotter it a little bit, and then do the same thing over and over again. And then finally, until the uh, distal cap, you break through and have true lumen access. Again, avoiding a subinimal canalization. Along those lines, this um, alligator forceps called the front runner, uh, which kind of looks like the, uh, the forceps. And the idea here is you're not uh, biopsying the tissue, but you're actually spreading it. So you advance the forceps, you spread the occlusion, the CTO, um, and then you move the catheter forward, spread it again, and again, the idea is that you stay true lumen, not subinimal. There are additional catheters that, again, require you to um, stay true lumen, or hopefully stay true lumen. Uh, a couple of those are the Wildcat or Kitty Cat, um, which is a corkscrew through the CTO, and the idea is it's an Archimedes screw that um, you are sort of boring through the CTO and hopefully staying true lumen, as Luke Wilkins say, says the most... Uh, difficult part about the kitty cat is some point in the procedure, you have to ask for a kitty cat, uh, which is somewhat humiliating. Um, the ocelot is very similar, except it's super fancy. Uh, it does the same similar thing, except it uses uh, OCT. So you can actually visualize whether you're true lumen or whether you're going in the right direction, you're headed eccentric or you're staying in the center of the lumen. And here's an image of the um, ocelot catheter. This is the, um, the OCT image and you can see you're sort of uh, in the lumen and you can see outside uh, whether you've gotten uh, subinimal or not. Oops, sorry. Again, sort of similar concept that it will rotate and the idea is that you bore through the chronic occlusion rather than uh, peel it off and go subinimal. Similar concept with the Viance catheter. Um, it's got a low profile sort of atraumatic tip and the idea is that you are spinning it and again, the spinning motion um, finds its way through the lesion and sort of crosses true lumen rather than going subinimal. And I think the last of the crossing catheters that we, um, we need to talk about that perhaps you haven't uh, used or heard of much is uh, the center cross and the multi-cross. These are sort of really interesting catheters. Here it sort of uses a, um, a stent-like apparatus to center yourself in the vessel. So the idea is that um, if you're just crossing with a wire and catheter, your wire and catheter are going to have bias, uh, eccentric bias to the subinimal space. Well, if you um, uh, deploy the stent uh, to center you, then you have to stay in the center of the vessel. And the idea is that you won't go one way or the other. The multi-cross is an interesting concept, whereas that only it's got three different uh, wire ports to give you three different chances to cross the lesion um, uh, through one of those ports. And here's an example of that. 
So we're going to go from crossing to um, atherectomy devices, and the laser is a nice segue. And the reason is the laser um, uh, atherectomy catheter is really the only atherectomy device that can also be used as a crossing catheter. And the reason is you can cross a CTO um, without being over the wire with the laser. And basically the way it works is you engage the cap, you activate the laser, um, you try to thread a little bit of wire, you activate it some more, thread a little wire, and the idea is that you're sort of burning, moving, burning, moving, burning, moving. Um, clearly, you can still go subinimal or in some cases outside the vessel with this. Uh, but if you stay straight, you can uh, get through a lesion. And on top of that, you are doing some uh, atherectomy, which we'll discuss in a moment. So in terms of atherectomy, here is the um, U.S. atherectomy market share from 2016, which is an estimate. Um, this slide is courtesy of Mike Watts. Um, clearly, this is dynamic, and, and some of these change year to year or um, over a five-year span. So there are different categories of atherectomy. And again, the basic principle of atherectomy is that we are either disrupting, removing, uh, somehow boring out or uh, displacing the atheromatous plaque or calcium from inside the lumen with the idea that this is prepping the vessel generally for something else. Uh, angioplasty, drug-coated balloon, um, sometimes as a standalone technique. There are different types of atherectomy. Um, one, it's orbital. A uh, classic example is the CSI uh, atherectomy catheter, which uses this um, eccentrically placed uh, burr that when it spins at a high velocity will actually sort of shave the um, inside of the vessel and the idea is that it sends the particulate distally why doesn't it cause major embolization because the idea is that it shaves it to a small enough particulate size that it will pass through the capillaries um, clearly that is not 100 percent uh, true especially if it uh, aggregates um, but for the most part if it's used judiciously and uh, carefully you can get this without major adverse sequela uh, directional atherectomy is like a razor blade where you're actually carving out um, the plaque and removing it. Classic example is the um, uh, Silverhawk Turbohawk catheter device. Uh, laser we already discussed, which is a photoablative de device. Rotational uh, atherectomy um, uses uh, Archimedes screw type uh, technology and carves out the plaque. Um, some of these will then aspirate uh, actively or some of these will just collect it uh, as an Archimedes screw uh, into the catheter itself. So the laser device we already discussed briefly. Um, it's the only FDA indicated atherectomy technology for instant restenosis. Uh, keep in mind some of these devices that have blades are um, not indicated for instant restenosis um, because they can catch on the stent. Not that they're not used off-label, um, but you just have to be very careful. Here, uh, the laser, you know, there's nothing really to catch. The laser works through three mechanisms of action. Uh, photochemical, which actually breaks molecular bonds, and the idea is that it vaporizes uh, whatever material it makes contact with. Uh, photothermal, so that it softens collagen and protein fibers, and again creates this vapor bubble uh, in order to sort of uh, photoablate uh, or um, these plaque. And then photomechanical, which again uh, causes expansion and contraction of vapor bubbles and hammers through this hard plaque uh, with the idea of uh, photoablating and dissolving it. The Diamondback device we already referenced, which is the orbital atherectomy device, this eccentric uh, burr uh, that will um, uh, sort of shave around the vessel itself. And here's a nice example of what I was talking about before. You can see the particulate matter um, is less than the size of a red blood cell in, you know, idealized setting here. Um, so it's, you know, less than, you know, eight microns um, or so. Um, there are different types of Diamondback burrs. There's solid, um, classic. Um, I'll tell you, for most of the tibial work, we use the micro crown, which is the 125 uh, device, and this can be used um, very distally. This can be used into the pedal loop if needed. Um, some of the larger crowns are much more appropriate for an SFA lesion. The rotablator is a, a similar device. Again, uh, it's designed to ablate hard plaque and calcium into microparticles that should pass through and not cause major embolization. Um, same idea, it spins and sort of shaves this down. The new kit on the block, which was just released uh, relatively recently, was the, is the Rotorex uh, atherectomy device. Um, this is a combination of a rotating catheter head um, that will sort of uh, carve out these lesions, but it's also coupled with an aspiration 
um, technology so that not only is it uh, cut out, but actually sucks it away and hopefully decreases the risk of embolization. Um, and the trials, again, low uh, embolization rate, it's never going to be zero um, for most devices, but um, pretty low. So moving away from orbital and rotational to directional, uh, this is the uh, Hawk device. Um, there's a couple different generations um, with Silverhawk and Turbohawk and uh, Hawk 1 sort of being the more popular. Um, this has got a little bit of a cutter window with a, a razor blade like device that actually shaves um, directionally, longitudinally, this plaque. And the reason the plaque doesn't fly is it collects it in this nose cone. And then you can do this until the nose cone gets filled. And then you take the device out, clean the nose cone, and you can reuse it. This device, again, comes in different sizes, um, everything from a 7 French um, to a smaller device that can be used for the tibials. And actually, I've, uh, um, uh, these devices can, can be so low profile, you can use them it, really in distal pedal. And I've, I've seen before using them in, uh, uh, around the loop and actually through the pedal loop, which you know, isn't necessarily recommended, but can be done in some cases. Um, I will tell you, if you have a very sharp anterior tibial artery takeoff, uh, sometimes this can be difficult to get down into a tibial artery distally um, with tough angulation. Um, but if you have favorable anatomy, like I said, this can go pretty pretty well anywhere. And the nice thing, of course, is you collect this plaque and you can take a photograph and show the patient you know, the hamburger that you took out of them. Um, a lot of these atherectomy devices are used with embolic protection devices. I'm not going to go into detail. Um, there are some devices that require certain embolic protection devices. So for example, the jet stream device really should uh, be used primarily with a NAV6, not with a spider wire. Hawk um, can be used with a spider wire. A CSI uh, Diamondback actually needs a specific uh, wire in order to use it um, with a NAV6. So, you know, if you're going to use atherectomy devices, just sort of be comfortable with it. Um, there's a device, uh, the Phoenix device, which is a, a similar sort of rotating device. Um, their embolization rate is extraordinarily low. Um, Again, it's never going to be zero, but but depending on what you become comfortable with, the level of the patient's disease, and also what their runoff vessel looks like, um, you may or may not want to use embolic protection device. Uh, again, sort of getting more fancy, this is the Pantheris device. Uh, it is similar to the uh, Hawk uh, generation of devices, except it uh, also allows imaging with uh, OCT. And so you can see exactly where you're shaving. So if your uh, plaque burden is more at the six o'clock position, you know, it makes sense for you to shave at the six o'clock position and not uh, at the 12 o'clock. The Jetstream device uh, is a Boston Scientific device. Again, uses this um, uh, front cutter um, where you can have blades up or blades down. You can use it in both ways. And the idea is that it will uh, cut and remove the plaque. The nice thing is, again, this has active aspiration. This used to be the only act atherectomy device with active aspiration, but again, uh, uh, Rotorex or Rotarex uh, has just been released and that has active aspiration as well. Um, but this is a, a device that ha combines the two technologies. Phoenix device is the one I just referenced that um, uh, has a pretty low embolization rate by their studies. Uh, this uh, cuts it. Um, and again, like an Archimedes screw, it sort of collects all the plaque inside here. So <clears throat> those are sort of the overview of the crossing imaging and um, atherectomy devices and treatment devices. I'm going to briefly talk about the drug uh, eluding or antiproliferative devices. Now, before we proceed, I do have to mention, uh, clearly there's been a lot of controversy uh, starting in about December of last year, 2019, with regard to um, some studies showing that paclitaxel in the um, endovascular <clears throat> peripheral artery world um, was associated with an increased mortality. I'm not going to go into detail here. But I think if you use paclitaxel devices, you must become familiar with those studies um, and sort of uh, where this stands in terms of FDA and your own personal feeling on the use of these devices. Uh, there are different uh, types of devices. Uh, one is the drug-coated balloon, and the other is drug-eluting stent. Of uh, the drug-coating balloon, there are three available in the United States right now. I think there's a million available out in Europe, but in the United States, we have three. Um, Stellarix or Stellarix is one of them. Um, Stellarix, uh, the big difference between all these drug-coated balloons is the, um, uh, uh, the drug dose and then also the incipient. So in other words, what holds it, holds the drug on the balloon. And those are sort of the big differences. Um, here, <clears throat> this is a low drug dose. Um, so two, micro, two micrograms per millimeter squared per area. Um, and you can see pretty good uh, patency rate. Stellarox's uh, claim to fame is that their trial 
had a slightly more or had significantly more um, calcified lesions. And so they build themselves as sort of the, oh, we're good in calcified lesions. Um, again, there hasn't been a head to head looking at calcified lesions with DCB at uh, different DCBs, but um, their study was sort of uh, designed to, to emphasize that. You can see severe calcium in their study um, was, was pretty significant. The impact admiral balloon is another drug coated balloon, a uh, higher drug dose at three and a half micrograms per millimeter squared. This excipient is urea. Um, so again, different than the other uh, DCBs. <clears throat> and then Lutonix, which was the first to market. Um, and again, it's sort of a low dose at two micrograms per millimeter squared. The carrier is um, polysorbate and sorbitol. Um, and the idea is that these all sort of coat the drug wall, get into the wall and um, interfere with smooth muscle cell proliferation. In terms of drug eluting stents, there are two on the market in the United States right now. The oldest is Zilver PTX, and Zilver PTX um, now has uh, five-year data, which is uh, uh, pretty um, important. And um, the idea is that you implant it, and then it loots over time the Paxil into the vessel wall. <clears throat> here's an example of, um, or here's a nice chart, sort of going through the different devices from. Uh, Alluvia, which we'll talk about in a second, which is the other drug eluting stent, the Cook PTX, the Lutonix DCB and Impact DCB, paclitaxel density. So in other words, um, how much paclitaxel is in a unit area. And then if you, um, you know, treat a seven <clears throat> by 80, um, um, seven centimeter by 80 millimeter segment, uh, how much total dose you're using. Um, and then a paclitaxel exposure. And some people are using this to say, oh, you know, you have a lot more drug dose. And so if there is a mortality risk, um, would it go up with, with uh, increased drug dose? And, um, you know, that, that remains to be seen. That's still unsettled data. The Alluvia, again, is the second uh, drug eluting stent available in the United States. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. It, it is um, uh, Two-year results have come out recently and at 92.5% freedom from target lesion revascularization. So again, I think these stents are clearly are beneficial to patients with obviously the elephant in the room being what on earth is going with the mortality, what on earth is going on with the uh, mortality risk. Here's a little bit of a, a difference slide between Zover PTX and Alluvia. Uh, the idea is that Zover PTX uh, eludes all its drug and then sort of uh, comes down. Alluvia has a longer uh, range to time uh, of elution um, post procedure, and there are some studies that show that it uh, elutes paclitaxel up until you know a year out. Um, so, so that is a whirlwind tour of the devices available. Um, so my summary: you got to have a knowledge of device availability and appropriate use. Have I used every single one of these devices I just discussed? Of course not. Of course not, but I'm familiar with them and I know what I can pull and what I should lean on when I need it. And the truth of the matter is just fewer, use a couple, um, master a couple and really get very good at them. You don't need to know every crossing catheter. You don't need to know every atherectomy device, but pick two or three. Um, if you choose to use atherectomy at all, uh, pick two or three, same thing with um, crossing catheters, wires. Otherwise you drive yourself mad and probably lead to um, some inefficiencies. And that's it. Hopefully you enjoy this introduction and uh, go save some legs and patients and make people feel better.